Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be together and praising Jesus. What a fellowship, what a joy divine to be leaning on the everlasting arms. So, we're going to sing this song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I am leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, I am leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arms Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day Leaning on the everlasting arms I'm leaning, I am leaning Safe and secure from all alarms, I'm leaning, I am leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, I am leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, I am leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. I'm leaning, I am leaning. Leaning on the everlasting love. Wow, that was great shaking there, Marika. Sounds good. All right. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for the incredible grace that you show us, Lord. We've ushered out one year. We're coming into a new one. And Lord, I suppose there's lots of things we could complain about in the past year. But we cannot complain about your faithfulness and your goodness. And we can have every expectation and hope that your faithfulness and goodness will be with us this year. Doesn't mean we won't have trouble. We've had lots of that this past year. But we have Jesus. So open our eyes to what really matters and where real happiness and contentment comes from, not from happenings, not even getting rid of corona and masks and everything else. Our real contentment is in you, Jesus. So fix our eyes upon you, Lord, in this new year. May we run that race, Lord, trusting Jesus and discovering the goodness of God and the wonder of who you are to us and for us. We surrender to you afresh today. Our hearts, our souls, our future, our possessions, our health, everything. Lord, whatever we hold back, we have trouble. So give us hearts of surrender that we might know what it is to truly trust in you and discover in you we have all that we need. I pray this, Lord, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Letting go of every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I tried to win this war, I confess My hands are weary I need your rest Mighty warrior 
king of the fight No matter what I face, you're by my side When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things be my life and breath. I want what you Lord and know. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort, you are my steady hand, you are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher, your plans are always good, there's not a place where I'll go, you've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could As I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. the Lord. That's the way to start the year, isn't it? I will trust in you. My hope is in the Lord, looking to Jesus, because we have a God who leads us along. He leads us along sometimes in the beautiful high mountains, in the nice places, and he leads us through the dark valleys. Whatever we have to face this year, we have Jesus, and I praise God for that. This morning we'll be looking at a subject that might be uh, maybe a hard subject in one sense because it talks about the disciplines of God. It talks about some of those hard things, and yet we have a God who's faithful. And praise the Lord. Whatever he brings into our lives, it all works for the good. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, God gives a song in the night seasons and all the day long. Sometimes on the mountain, 
where the sun shines so bright God leads his dear children along Sometimes in the valley In darkest of night God leads his dear children along Some through the waters Some through the flood some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night seasons and all the day long. The sorrows befall us and evils oppose. God leads. His dear children along the grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Through great sorrow that God gives a song In the night seasons and all day long Away from the mire and away from the clay God leads his dear children along Away up in glory Eternity's day, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, and some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night seasons and all the day long Some through the waters, some through the flood Or oh, some through the fire, but all through the blood Some through great sorrow, God gives a song In the night seasons I've probably shared this before, but I remember seeing a choir from Africa singing this song, and it was after Idi Amin had basically wiped out their country and destroyed and murdered and butchered families after families. And the people in that choir were made up of the survivors of Idi Amin's reign of terror, where Christians were persecuted and put to death. And every one of them had lost family, children, wives, mothers, fathers. Every one of them had gone through great sorrow. And when you read uh, the, this hymn, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Amazing that they could stand and sing of the goodness and the care of God in the midst of such devastation. I praise God for his faithfulness. That's where we need to look. This next song is I've Never Been Out of His Care. The eyes of God are upon me He sees everything I do The arms of God are around me They keep me safe and secure and he knows where I am Every hour of every day 
He knows each thought I think He knows each word that I might say And although there have been times I've been out of His will I've never been out of His care His change world alarms me with war with sin and with strife but my loving father charms me with joy with peace and with life and he knows where I am every hour of every day He knows each thought I think He knows each word that I might say And although there have been times I've been out of His will I've never been out of His care And He knows where I am every hour of every day He knows each thought I think He knows each word that I might say And although there have been times I've been out of His will I've never been out of His care never been out of his care. No, isn't that good to know? Amen? Because uh, there have been times we've been out of his will, hasn't there? More than once. God on the mountain is still God in the valley. They want to restrict our singing, so we're going to do lots of songs. Life is easy up on the mountain. You've got peace of mind, but you've never known. But then things change and down in the valley Don't lose faith for You're never alone For the God on the mountain Still God in the valley When things go wrong He'll make it right and the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times The God of the day Is still God in the night You talk of faith when You're up on the mountain oh, But talk comes easy Life's at its best but Down in the valley Trials and temptations That's when faith is Really put to the test For the God on the mountain Still God in the valley things go wrong, He'll make it right. And the God of the good times, is still God in the bad times. The God of the day, is still God in the night. For the God on the mountain, Still God in the valley When 
things go wrong He'll make it right And the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times The God of the day Still God in the night the God of the day Is still God in the night I think we're going to do this song next Though You Slay Me So we'll do the next one So I just learned a song last night, so what happens, I'm not sure. But it so fit the message that we were going to do today on surrendering everything to God and accepting the things that we don't understand, the hard things. And I thought this song was appropriate, so... God, I come, I return to the Lord, one who's broken, one who's torn me apart. You strike down, bind me up, you say you do it all in love, I might know you. In your suffering Though you slay me Yet I will praise you Though you take from me I will bless your name Though you ruin me Still I will worship, sing a song, the one who's all I need. My heart and flesh may fail, the earth below give way, with my eyes, with my eyes, I'll see the Lord. Lifted high on that day, behold the Lamb that was slain, and I'll know every tear was worth it all. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you, though you take from me I will bless your name though you ruin me still I will worship sing a song one who's all I need Tonight I'm crying out Let this cup pass from me now You're still more than I need You're enough for me You're enough, oh yeah, for me Tonight I'm crying out Let this cup pass from me now You're still more than I need You're enough for me You're enough for me slay me yet I 
will praise you though you take from me I will bless your name though you ruin me still I will worship sing a song one who's all I return to the Lord, one who's broken, one who's torn me apart. You strike down, find me up, you say you do it all in love. I might know you in your suffering. Yet I will praise you Though you take from me I will bless your name Though you ruin me Still I will worship Sing a song to one who's all I need Sing a song the one who's all I need. Amen. Amen. Easy to say amen when we're up there. A little more difficult. Does this still remind you of anybody in the Bible? Job. Even if he slays me kills me I will trust in him I think it's time for a puppet show <laughs> happy new year everybody Yay! I'm glad it's a new year you know why because I didn't like the last one maybe this one's gonna be better Hey, Lemmy, how are you doing today? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Yay, it's a new year, and everything's going to be different now. What do you mean? Well, it's now it's 2022, so is that right, 2022? I get mixed up. Yep, okay, now that it's 2022, everything is going to be better. Really? Yep, coronavirus is gone. Uh, no more masks. Everything is over. We got a brand new start. It's a new year, right? Is that the way it works? No. Not the way it works, Lammy. Yeah, but it's a new year, so it should be new everything. Throw away those masks. Get rid of every coronavirus. is all gone because it's a new year. Nope, that's not the case. You know what? What? The troubles from last year are, are carrying on into this year. No. No. Yep. Well, I, why do we bother to celebrate a new year? Well, because it's a new year. Yeah, but what's new about it if everything's old? You're getting me confused. Huh. Well, what's new is that every day is a new day with Jesus. Amen? Yeah, every day is a new day. If it's a new year, then I've got a new opportunity to trust God. You're not going to find your happiness in whether coronavirus disappears or not. You're going to find it in Jesus. Oh, so because it's a new year, I just have to trust God the same as I did in the last year. That's right. Oh, but, well, what about the troubles? Shouldn't the troubles go away someday? Yes, they're going to go away someday. Does anybody know when all troubles will be gone forever? Never? What? Oh, there, I heard it over there. What did you say? When we're in heaven, all the troubles will be gone. But before that, we're going to have lots of trouble. 
We are. Well, can't we just have one day with no trouble? Well, maybe sometimes you can have a f some time with no trouble, but trouble is always there. But if you follow God, then you won't have any troubles at all. Isn't that true? Nope, that's not true either. The Bible says God causes the rain to fall on the good and the not good, the just and the unjust. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, when it rains, it rains on everybody. Yep, when trouble comes, sometimes trouble falls on us all. But sometimes when we sin, we do bad things, we make some more trouble that we don't need, we don't have to have. That's true. I know that because I did lots of that this year, and I got in lots of trouble I didn't need to have. Well, what are you going to do about this year? Uh, well, I'm learning that I can't make promises I can't keep. So I'm going to try to trust God to help me not to sin. That's a good plan. Yeah. Does everybody think sin is bad? Yeah, yeah sin is not good. Uh, what's some sins that people can do? I don't know. What about disobeying your parents? Not listening to your mama or your papa? Do you ever do that? Hmm. I think everybody did that at least once. Should we listen to our mama and papa? Yes, we should. And maybe this year we can ask Jesus to help us not to disobey our parents. Hey, that sounds like a good plan. Well, I try to listen to my mama and papa when my mama says, Let me, I want you to go to bed. Sometimes I go to bed right away. But sometimes I don't and I get in trouble. And she says, Lemmy, you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, well, you know what? But your mama still takes care of you? Yeah, my mama loves me and she takes care of me. And I'm glad. And But sometimes I get in trouble and she makes me stay in my stall. Like my room. Oh, yeah. And I don't want to, but I have to because my mama knows best. Wow, you learned a lot for the new year. I hope everybody here trusts God in the new year and does what's right. And even if trouble comes, we can pray and we can talk to God. Yes, we can. And in the end, God's going to make it all right. Yeah, that's true, too. Well, well, you know what? Even though it's a new year... You still got to get milked? I do. Yep. And uh, I need to go pretty quick, so let's go. You know when it's like when you got to have a pee? Well, for me, it's I got to have a milk. Okay, we got to go. Okay, see you guys later. Happy New Year to you in Jesus. Wow. Oh, I'm going to try and obey my mama more. Trouble comes. Hold on. Hold on to God because he's holding on to you. We lay hold of, Philippians tells us in chapter 3, we lay hold of that which, which he has laid hold of us for. Praise God. Paul and Silas went to jail Had no money to pay their bail Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on, hold on Taylor thought they had escaped he got saved by the open gate Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on, hold on, hold on Hold on Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on, hold on, hold on Hold on Keep your eyes on Hold on, hold on Want to leave your life of sin Be like the jailer, let Jesus in Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on, hold on He's 
He's the way, the truth, the life He's the one who ends your strife Keep your eyes on the prize Hold on, hold on Jesus waits, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on, he's the one who'll get you home, by his power you'll overcome, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. God is good, friends. We have so many wonderful gifts. But we're going to talk today about the discipline of God. Not an easy talk subject. And this discipline of God, you know, the word that's used here in, in, in discipline, the words that's used uh, when we talk about um, the chastisement of the Lord, it's not just all you know, God is out to get us sort of thing. This word discipline carries with it, yes, it carries the kind of discipline that sometimes we really need, severe discipline. But it also carries with it instruction, and it carries with it the incredible love and care of Almighty God. Sometimes discipline has been, is, is a dirty word in our culture, and it isn't a dirty word in the mind of God. It's a word of grace and a word of caring for what parent does not discipline their child. So let's go and back to Hebrews chapter 12. We've been talking about running the race. We've been talking about Jesus Christ. We've been talking about him being the author and the finisher of our faith. And we spoke last week about considering Christ, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. So what he does here is he sets us up to understand that hostility and trial are going to be part of your life. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. And so the idea that Christians somehow magically, after you get saved, don't have any more troubles, I think every one of us have discovered that's not the case. That troubles come, and sometimes increased trouble will come because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So when we consider Jesus, and the hostility that he received. Um, think about him. He's been there. Again, he's known what it is to be persecuted, and he knew what it was to have all the world against him. And he says, consider this, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, I don't know about you, but have you had any times in the last year of some discouragement in your life? Have you? Yeah. And is it easy to become discouraged? It sure is. And so he's, he knows that. The writer knows that. The Spirit of God knows how easily we become discouraged. God knows that there are times when we become weary and discouraged in our souls, where it feels like we can't take one more step. 
But then he says something here. He says this, look, but listen, he says in Hebrews 12, 4, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. When it says striving against sin, it just doesn't mean striving against you sinning personally. It includes that. But it, the whole picture is striving against all sin and how it comes against us and how the world treats us and how the situations go in our lives where, where wickedness seems to prevail. Because we look back at Jesus and it says he received hostility from sinners against himself. But he did. He resisted to bloodshed, didn't he? He went to bloodshed, but we haven't. At this point, the Hebrews hadn't. Now, they had experienced some trouble. In Hebrews 10, 32, it says, Recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you had seen the truth, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. They had experienced struggles. They had experienced sufferings. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulation, you were made fun of, you were mocked. You were reproached, and you received tribulations. But at that point, they hadn't been being put to death for their faith. But that could possibly come, and indeed it did come. It came where many of these who were being written to in Hebrews chapter 10 were going to face the lion's den because persecution was going to increase, not decrease. And partly while you became companions of those who were so treated, because you hung around with Christians who were mocked, you got mocked too. You got persecuted. But at this point, they hadn't resisted the blood, but that day would come, and it may come for us too. So back in Hebrews 12, 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. In other words, if you're getting weary or getting discouraged, don't forget this. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, that is the correcting hand of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. God sometimes rebukes us. We ought to take his rebuke, not be offended at his rebuke, but rather accept it. You know, in the word of God, it tells us that uh, the word, the scriptures are profitable. They're profitable for doctrine. They're profitable for Reproof, that is to show you where you're wrong. We need to be shown where we're wrong. That is that for instruction in righteousness, it's profitable. So it's good that God will rebuke you when you're going in the wrong direction. It's good that God will chastise you. He will correct you. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? I'm going to read it in a different translation here. You have forgotten the encouraging words that God speaks to you as his children. My child, pay attention when the Lord disciplines you. Don't give up when he corrects you. The Lord disciplines everyone he loves. He severely disciplines everyone he accepts as his child. If we're going to be good parents then we need to discipline our children. We need to be there for them and encourage them, but we need to draw lines, don't we? You know what? It's one of the hardest things to do with your children is to draw lines and keep those lines. Because what do they do? They push those lines. They always push them as far as they can go. It's not easy, but love sees the big picture. Love sees if I spoil this child now, she's going to have or he a lot more trouble later on. So I have to, even if it hurts me, and I believe that God feels the pain when he has to discipline us. I don't believe that God is indifferent to those things. I know he's not because the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit actually groans when we are groaning when we are suffering, when we are going through trial. So though God needs to discipline us and correct us, he does it for our profit. He does it to help us. He does it so that we might know the blessing of God. 
he sees the big picture. This quote comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, for whom the Lord loves he corrects, just as the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. The discipline of God is the expression of love. Take that. Understand it. As you begin the new year, as we've gone through, you know, so much stuff in this past year, and it looks like more stuff again this year, as far as in general in the world, understand that God is being gracious. And even the troubles that come in this world are the gracious hand of God. It seems, now I could be wrong about this, but with all the data that's in, it is the most affluent people in the world that have re reaped the, the hardest results from the coronavirus. Now, I might be wrong about that. But I could say that the ones that seem to be more affluent, they're the ones that got it first and, and the ones that it spread to the most. And it may very well be the chastening hand of God on this world on our concept and idea that affluence is everything because it isn't. I was reading something by Chrysostom, who was one of the ancient fathers, one of the ones just after Christ. And there's some tremendous writings by, by people who are right after the Bible, the next generation. And he was one of those. And he said, people look at famine and they say, oh, how horrible it is. And it is. It's terrible. But they don't see that indulgence and affluence is just as horrible. You see, if you think about people who are in starvation situations, they ought to be ministered to. There is no question about that. But then you look on the other side of it. And yes, some of them even die from hunger. But let me tell you something, opulence and uh, stuffing your faces until you're, you're sick. And our, a lot of our society today is physically sick because of how we have been overindulgent in so much. We're sick. And if you took away modern medicine, we'd probably have as many people die of overeating and all that comes with it and all the garbage we put in ourselves as many people who die of starvation. I'm not, that's not, that's true, you know. And so opulence isn't everything. Having all that you can get is not everything. And sometimes God takes some of our toys away and takes some of our things away and we groan and we complain as if it's the end of the world. God needs to do what he needs to do to focus us on what's most important in life. And so sometimes that's the correcting hand of God in general to this world. And sometimes it's specific to the people of God. If there's trouble that comes upon you, don't think that somehow God doesn't love you. Don't think that it's, it's um, uh, you, you, maybe it's, maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Because sometimes the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. But if you know that you have sinned, repent of it. If you're aware of sin in your life, turn from it and turn your heart over completely to the Lord. Because this is the truth of the matter. If God is not correcting you, if you're going astray in sin and there's no correction, you just carry on as if it's all good and, and away I go, then you're in big trouble. Then you need to understand that you're not even one of the children of God. Because you know what God does with his children? He corrects them. If you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers, every one of God's children is going to be corrected, then you're illegitimate and not sons. <clears throat> if you don't get corrected, then that's what's going on. We've had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed, for a few days, chasten does as seem best to them, but he does it for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. God, as you've heard me say this before, God is more interested in your holiness than your happiness. We are more interested in our happiness than our holiness. I wish we could get ourselves aligned with God's way of thinking 
and understand holiness is more important than happiness. Happiness is a very temporary thing, but holiness is eternal. And weeping may endure for the night, but joy does come in the morning. Even as Peter said to Jesus, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, nobody has left anything to follow me that he will not receive a hundred times more in this life and eternal life to come. You don't lose by surrendering to God. You don't lose by allowing God to change your character to be more like Jesus. Often the pathway of suffering is not the easy path. It's often the one that no one wants to take. Hebrews 12, 11 says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but it's painful. It's painful. It's not easy. It's not meant to be easy because afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God uses trials. God uses troubles. God uses circumstances Sometimes he uses them to correct us because we're sinning. Sometimes he uses it to grow us in our character. That's part of that instruction that goes with chastisement. That's part of that learning curve that God brings into our life so that the peaceable fruit of righteousness is happening in your life. That's what God's looking for. He's growing a beautiful plant so that beautiful flowers will come out on the top. But in order for that to happen, he has to do things to that plan. You know, sometimes I listen to um, Radio Noon, and there's a Marge Wils Wils Wilson Wilkins. I can't remember her name. Her name is Marge, I'm pretty sure. Marjorie. Anyway, what? Marjorie. 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 Okay, they call, they, they call in and they ask questions, and they say, well, my plant, you know, it's just not really doing very good. And she gets back on and she says, cut the thing right off. But they love their plant. You cut it off, she says, because if you cut it off, then it will grow back and it'll grow back right. So sometimes God cuts you off and you don't like it. What are you doing, God? I've got all this stuff going on. This is happening. This is happening. You're taking it all away from me. She says, I need to take it away from you because I got something better coming. Let me trust me. A gardener, a good gardener, looks after their plants and they take care of them and they know just what to do, to clip this and clip that and prune. And But you get somebody like me and you got chaos and you got dead plants and you got dead stuff hanging all around and you got no flowers and you got nothing if you got me looking after your garden. I, I just know that. Now, Grace, on the other hand, she didn't get that from me. So you can see practically and in real life, this is not something that's far fetched. This is not something far away in some, you know, uh, alternate universe. This is reality. This is how things work. And this is how God works in us. And of course, you don't see the end result of it right away. When you're in it, you can't understand it. And you can be crying out, why God? Why God? Why is this happening to me? But afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Do you see that? To those who have been trained by it. Are you willing to be trained by the Lord? Are you willing to let the Lord have his way in your life? Are you willing to let the Lord have his way over this issue? What about this issue over here? What about, what about my life? What about surrendering everything to God? He train, he's training you. You're in the training ground. Let him train you. Remember, he's a good coach. He's a coach that understands. He's a coach that's been there. And the coach that's done that. And so the exhortation here is, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. The picture that he gives here. This is what the picture that he gives. Oh, oh I'm just discouraged. You, you feel like that some days? Oh, I'm hanging down here. So strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees that can barely hold you up. 
Now, how does that happen? It happens by being strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It happens by faith because I realize, God, though you slay me, I can still trust you. That God knows what He's doing. That God has a plan in the middle of this. That the pruning might be happening. That circumstances that are happening in my life is, oh no, not this. Ah, I just can't stand another blow. But God knows exactly what you need and when you need it. There is no trial, but such as is common to men that we all go through. But God is faithful to provide a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. We can trust him. And here's why it says to do this. Make straight paths for your feet. Walk the straight path. Walk the narrow road that God gives to you. Make it for your feet. For the, why? Because... So that which is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And actually, the term here is you make a good path so that the person who's very weak and broken can make it too. It won't be gone out of the way. So that you can move, they can move forward with you. Because what you do affects everybody else, right? We need one another. So as you walk through the valley and you discover the faithfulness of God and you make a straight path through the valley, others can follow too. And you actually experience the healing hand of God in the process as well. Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. We find this principle all through the New Testament. We find it here in James 1 2. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Is that what you do? When's the last time you counted it all joy to have a trial in your life? The Bible actually tells us to do that. What a nutcase this is. Why would God tell you to count it all joy when you're going in various trials? It's not even just one trial here. When you fall into various trials, many trials. Oh boy, more trials. <laughs> we got a lot to learn, don't we? We got a lot to learn. We need the hand of God. And sometimes God allows those trials Know this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. But you let patience have its perfect work, so you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Lacking nothing? What if the trial is, is I have nothing? How can I be lacking nothing if I have nothing? Because I have the real things. The things that really matter the things that are most precious is what God wants you to have. The rest of it, it comes and it goes. It's all temporary. It's all temporary. People look forward to the new year with the hope of great prosperity to come. And we may not have any prosperity at all. It seems to me, from my little observations of my few years on earth, that as far as great prosperity is concerned for the most people on this planet, we're on the way down from that, not on the way up. The opportunities that were available when I was a young man, they're not quite so available today. It's much more difficult to look ahead. With a confidence in the things of this world, with a confidence in uh, the careers and the houses and the lands and the possessions, Oh, don't set your hopes there anyway. Set them in Jesus and discover this truth. I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Spurgeon said this. And if you don't know who Spurgeon was, look him up on the net. Read some of his sermons and it'll make you weep with joy and with Discovery of God, a tremendous man of God who preached in the late 1800s and his sermons went around the world. He said, I'm afraid that all the grace that I got out of my comfortable and easy times and happy hours might almost lie on a penny. So he says, that's how small 
the grace that I got from all my comfortable and easy times and happy hours. But the good that I received from my sorrows and pains and griefs is altogether incalculable. Affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house. It is the best book in a minister's library. Now, I don't mean for you to go out and see if you can find some affliction. Don't go out and see if you can get persecuted by shouting in someone's face or by being obnoxious. It'll come without you going looking for it. I assure you. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 says, We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. God brings troubles into our lives. He allows them in our life. Sometimes it's because we've sinned and we need to be corrected. Sometimes it's because God has a different plan for us. He has something to develop in our character that won't happen any other way. I've said this many times, but I have found when I have met people who've gone through deep trials and people who have gone through great sorrows, I have found a character much deeper, much deeper and sweeter than those who la-di-da through life. He says, so the genuineness of your faith is being much more precious than gold that perishes. It's much more precious. The genuineness of your faith is more precious than the things. Gold is the most precious thing. The perishes. Though it is tested by fire, though your faith is tested by fire, it may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gold was put in the crucible, and the more that it's refined, the more precious it becomes, the more pure it becomes. So God allows you to be tested by fire. God allows you to go through the crucible so that your faith will be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. What? He's saying this in the midst of various trials. He's saying this in the midst of experiencing this testing. He's saying this in the midst of the fact that they are being grieved by those various trials. You're still rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You can be sorrowing but rejoicing at the same time. You can always be rejoicing in the Lord. We had a nice little study on that a few weeks ago. And by the way, we still have study on Wednesday night. Are you able to have it this Wednesday, or do you know? I can. Okay, it'll be at Geraldine's house. Joy inexpressible and full of glory. Woo! There is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. There is joy unspeakable, full of glory. All the half has never yet been told. But is it... Is it so in the midst of suffering? Is it so in the midst of deep trial? My friends, we can go there. The world looks for every other answer for the struggle that we have with deep trials. The world looks for some pill to fix it all, and it doesn't. I'm not dissing medication where it's needed, but I'm telling you that the real answer is finding joy in Jesus Christ even in the midst of the darkness and the trials, even in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of worry, in the midst of fears. I can find an anchor for my soul. I can find hope in the darkness. I can find light to carry me forward, but it's in the Lord. It's nowhere else. First Peter 1 Peter 1.9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then he says, Of this salvation the prophets had inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Again, we see 
Jesus. Consider him, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the sufferings of God's people, I can tell you that the other side of that coin is the glories that will follow. They will follow. There's a page in there. You want to bring it out to me? No. There's one in here somewhere, I think. That's a good question, but there. Well, no. I guess I thought I put it in here. But I guess I didn't. Hmm. No. I don't know what's up there. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that's us. The treasure is the Lord. That the excellence of the power may be of God, and it's not of us. And then he says this, We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Even if our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so he says, in one sense, we're always dying, dying to the world, dying to things, dying to self, but we're not losing heart because as we are dying outwardly, we are growing up inwardly because our light affliction Light affliction, Paul says. Hey, have you seen what Paul went through? Did you ever read what Paul went through? Light affliction? Man, if anybody was afflicted, it was him. If anyone had any cause to say, I give up, it would be Paul. But he says, no, our light affliction is but for a moment. It's passing. This too will pass. That's a little phrase that sometimes I think about when I'm going through. I say, this too will pass. Don't forget that. This too will pass. And weeping does endure for the night, but joy does come in the morning because of the faithfulness of Almighty God. Praise the Lord. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's have our eyes in the right place. Let's understand the glorious faithfulness of God and discover that His faithfulness is exactly what we need. I praise the Lord for His faithfulness and His goodness to us. So now in Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. So here we have our weaknesses. Here we have our struggles. And really, if you look in the previous verses, it talks about the chaos of this creation because of sin and the need of the Spirit of God. He helps us in our weakness, for we do not pray what, what we should pray for as we ought to. But instead, when we can't pray, we we're saying we don't know what to pray. We don't know how to pray. You get so depressed, you don't know how to pray. Have you ever been there? But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. But he does it with groanings. He groans. You're groaning, he's groaning. God is touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. He's not indifferent to those things. He cares deeply for you and what you're going through. He understands. And so it says this in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things, you know this verse frontwards and backwards, work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. Not some things, all things things God is so good 
Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. We know that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because of the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he has given us. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Oh, the glory of it. What an awesome God. What a wonderful Savior. It's coming. The day is coming when all this will be dealt with. Psalm 119.67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. Well, then let the affliction come. May God afflict you in the new year if it will draw you closer to him. Boy, that's not quite what the wealth, health, and prosperity people teach, is it? Uh, boy, I got a pastor that prays that I'll get afflicted. <laughs> May he do the same to me, whatever is needed, so that I will become more like Jesus. And now we turn to the Apostle Paul and we turn to a situation in his life where he was afflicted. Where he was afflicted by the devil. And he says, I, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Now what do you think that means? Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Anybody translate that for me? What is it again? Uh, he was receiving revelations, abundance of them. Yes. Lest I become proud because of the revelations that I have received. You see that? Okay. So, Paul is confessing something here. There's a tendency to what? Pride. To pride, right? There's a tendency to pride. And yes, Paul had an abundance of revelations. And so God, he, Paul understands why now. Okay, he's telling you, this is why this has happened in my life. I'm having an affliction in my life, but I have it so that I won't become proud. Now, it's not saying that he is proud now, but he realizes I need to be kept humble. Okay, so... The correcting hand of God sometimes is to deal with sin that you've already committed, but it's also to protect you from sin that you would commit. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So lest I should become proud because of the abundance of revelations that I have, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. This is how he describes it. A thorn in the flesh. Now, I got, if you want thorns, I can take you up to my property in Southwest Marguerite, and there are thorns. I mean, there are whole rows of thorn bushes, and the needles are about this long, and I don't know what's in those needles, but all you have to do is just touch the skin, and man, does it ever hurt. I, there must be some poison in the end of them things. They're awful. I hate getting pierced by them. I despise them, and they're so hard to do anything with. To cut them down, you've got to try to reach in underneath with a power saw, and it, well, you're bound to get it. It's stuck in your arm, it's stuck in your hand. One thorn's enough, but, boy, he says, I got a thorn in the flesh. This is the picture that he gives. By the way, I thank God that Jesus Christ wore the crown of thorns for me. He says, I got a thorn in my flesh. Now, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And he says it again, lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I should become proud. It seems kind of got like a mixed message here, doesn't it? He says, I was given this thorn in the flesh. It's the devil that's given it to me. But 
It's to keep me humble. What's going on here? Well, first of all, if you look in the book of Galatians, you'll discover that Paul had eye trouble. At one point, Paul says, if it was possible, you would take out your own eyes and give them to me. When he came to his letters, there's only one letter where he says, you see what with large letters I've written, I've signed this, this letter. It seems obvious that Paul had a severe eye problem. And here's the guy that was going around, and God was using him to heal people. People were getting healed. But not Paul. That's humbling, isn't it? If you're such a great healer, why don't you heal yourself, Paul? So there was an affliction, and it was from Satan. That's what it says here. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Three times Paul earnestly brought this problem that he had to the Lord. He, I want to get rid of this. This is an encumbrance. I don't want this anymore. And he cries out to God. And I don't think it was like, Lord, please fix this. Lord, please fix this. Lord, please fix this. And that was it. I believe that he earnestly sought the Lord one time. And then another day he went back at it again and earnestly sought God. And probably a little time later he says, I'm not getting any answer. I'm bleeding with you again. But finally he got an answer. What was his answer? Well, you would expect his answer would be, I mean, it was a Paul. Why wouldn't he get, you know, healed? Oh, I'm healed. Look, my eyes are good now, everybody. That'll bring a lot of people to the Lord. Lord, you think how many people are going to say, wow, Paul's eyes are healed? Lots of people get saved if that happens. Lord? Mm. Now here's God's answer. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That was God's answer. That wasn't the answer that you might expect, eh? He says, no, Paul, I'm leaving this with you. And he obviously made it clear, I'm leaving this with you because you need it for humility's sake. But you need it because my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. Paul, people don't need to see how strong you are. They need to see how weak you are so that they will see my strength, not yours, Paul. We're the earthen vessels. He's the Lord. So God's plans are different than what we've planned. We set our own agendas and we think that's what's going to happen. It may not be the case. Have you got weakness in your life? Then it's an opportunity for you to trust the Lord's strength. You have weakness, whatever it might be. It may be you have a weak disposition. You maybe have weakness in your body. You may have weakness in your mind. All those things, God can turn them for the good and his strength will be made perfect in that very weakness. So Paul says, I will most gladly boast in my infirmities. I'm not going to boast in who I am. I'm not going to boast in what I am. I don't want to go there, Paul says. I don't want to be exalted above measure. I want Christ to be exalted. So I will boast in my infirmities so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'll take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, and in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you see the discipline hand of God in Paul's life? And you see what he sees now? There's blessing here. There's blessing here. So my friends, whether it's because of sin that you're practicing now that you need the discipline of God, or whether it's because of impending sin that you're maybe not even aware of, God is faithful. Now, in, uh, we're almost done here. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. It speaks about people who are taking the Lord's up, remembering the Lord's death together, which we just did, right? Probably should have read this beforehand. Whoever eats and bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. What does that mean? It means that I'm taking the bread and the cup and I'm acknowledging that Christ died for my sins. I'm taking this in as a Christian and yet I'm living in sin and I'm not repenting. Ooh, 
He says, you're doing something unworthy here. You're misrepresenting God. Look what it says here. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's an opportunity for you to stop, be still, and say, okay, God, is there sin in my life? If there is, I need to confess it now and then take the bread and cup. Make sense? Because if I don't, here's what it says. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. And in this case, what was happening, people were coming together to have the Lord's Supper, to break bread together, and some, but they also came with a common meal. But the trouble was it wasn't very common. The trouble was is that the rich people sat down and they feasted and the poor people had nothing and they looked at them over there and they just kept on gorging themselves with food while the others were hungry. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 11. Read it for yourself. And Paul is saying, you're making a mockery of this. You're going to do this and then you're going to take this bread and cup as if everything is fine. And, oh yeah, I have Jesus. And meantime, you're not even sharing the love and the care and concern with your neighbor. You're drinking judgment on yourself not blessing. And then he says this, remarkably, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, don't you misunderstand me that I think that all sickness is because, and death is because of some sin. In this case, it is why the Corinthian church was experiencing such devastation among them. They were actually physically becoming ill, and many of them had died. That's what it means when it says they fell asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Did you get that? So there's a strong warning here against sin, isn't there? And if, if we continue in it, because God loves us, this doesn't mean they're not saved. It means God will bring discipline on you. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined. See that? So we will not be finally condemned with the world. It's God's plan to discipline us for blessing, not for curse. Praise his name. Thank you, Jesus. And so we can see throughout the scriptures the necessity of discipline. I'm going to read you a quote from uh, John Piper in closing. Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Do you get that? Meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain from the fallen nature or fallen man, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism. I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course, you can't see what it's doing. Don't look at what is seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car careens into the sidewalk and takes her out, don't say that's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, do not lose heart, but take these truths and day by day focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get along with God and preach his word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are new and cared for. Let's pray. Our Father, we come, we thank you for your word, we thank you for its truth, and we pray, Lord, that you will open our minds and our eyes and our hearts and our understanding to be surrendered people to you, to be not tossed to and fro with every oh, crisis that comes along in life, but to discover the rock, the anchor of our souls, and to find our joy and our peace and our satisfaction in Jesus and nowhere else. So, Lord, pour out your blessing. Teach us this way of trusting you, of hearing your voice speak to us, my grace is sufficient for you. Thank you, Lord, that there are times when you do take burdens 
when you do lift sorrows. You give us times of joy. You're not a kill joy. You've actually promised more abundant life. But thank you for the disciplines you do bring into our lives that we might know God and we might walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.